a rainy weekend and then a cloudy Monday, but it doesn't stop us from doing business. Good morning. Welcome to Business Morning. I'm Eni John Mekwa. We begin a fresh week and we have 55 minutes today to do relevant and current business conversation. Let's start off as we would usually do with global oil prices. And we can tell you uh, from the global oil space that prices eased on Monday as traders await more rate high cues from the United States and European central banks with threatening supply and hopes for Chinese stimulus underpinning Brent's at $80 a barrel. Brent's crude features dipped 16 cents to $80.91 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude was at $76.90 a barrel, and that's down 17 cents. The benchmarks rose 1.5% and 2.2% respectively last week. They are full straight week of gains as supply is expected to tighten following OPEC plus cuts. Fighting also escalated last week in Ukraine after Russia withdrew from a UN brokered safe sea corridor agreement for grains export. Investors have priced in quarter point hikes from the Federal Reserve and European Central Bank this week. So the focus will be on what Fed Chair Jerome Powell and ECB President Christine Lagarde say about a future rate hike. I would add also Nigeria is also about to say uh, is another rate hike there. But rising interest rates have dampened investments and threatened the green back, making dollar-denominated commodities more expensive for holders of other currencies. Market participants also expect Beijing to implement targeted stimulus measures to support its flagging economy me, likely boosting oil demand in the world's number two consumer. Still talking oil now, but edible oil, Malaysian palm oil features fell on Monday, extending declines on the early trade, dragged by weaker vegetable oils in the daily and commodity exchange. The benchmark palm oil contracts for October delivery on the Bossa Malaysia Derivatives Exchange lost. 48 ringgit, and that's uh, down to 3,987 ringgit. That's about $871 a metric ton by midday. Indonesian palm oil exports, including refined products, stood at 2.23 million tons in May, and that's uh, according to data from Indonesian Palm Oil Association. Malaysia's palm oil export during July 1st to 20th rose 10.1% from the month before, according to AMSPEC, Agri-Malaysia, and 19% according to cargo surveyor Intertech. Dalian's most active soy oil contract fell 2.2%, while its palm oil contract lost 2.07%. Soil oil prices on the Chicago Board of Trade were up 0.56%. And palm oil is affected by price movements in related oils as they compete for a share in the global vegetable oils market. Well, let's leave the oil market just for a bit now and go to commodities. Chicago wheat and corn features rose on Monday as Russia's attacks on Ukrainian port infrastructure and slowing flow of shipments from the Black Sea region heightened concerns over supply disruptions. Soybeans rose for the first time in three sessions. Russia pounded Ukrainian food export facilities for a fourth day in a row on Friday and practiced seizing ships in the Black Sea in an escalation of what Western leaders say is an attempt to wriggle out of sanctions by threatening a global food crisis. Russia said its Black Sea fleet and practiced firing rockets at floating targets and it would deem all ships heading for Ukrainian waters to be potentially carrying arms. He responded with a similar warning about ships heading to Russia. Well, the looking to pick up grain cargoes from the Black Sea area has fallen 35% this week versus the previous week with growing uncertainty over whether commercial traffic could be hit as Russia continues to pound food facilities in Ukraine. Bad news there, and uh, I must say the impact flows to every part of the world, uh, Nigeria included. But let's see uh, directly here in the country 
uh, where the CPP is concerned, uh, says that the increase in money supply by 15% in one month between May and June 2023 has continued to be a source of concern uh, to the Center for Promotion of Private Enterprise as the CPPE. According to the Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Muda Yusuf, broad money grew by over 9 trillion naira from 55.7 trillion naira to 64.9 trillion naira. That it went from 55.7 to 64.9 trillion naira. This surge in monetary growth is unprecedented. Obviously, this must have had an effect on the exchange rate. Consequently, Dr. Yusuf believes that the monetary authorities should investigate this drastic growth in money supply and take steps to curb subsequent expansion as such dramatic growth in money supply poses a, a significant risk to macroeconomic stability, especially price stability. On the supply side, the trajectory is that uh, there would be an improvement in oil output, which would boost forex earnings, according to Dr. Yusuf. The prospect of improved domestic refining of petroleum products in the coming months will reduce forex demand pressure from importation of petroleum products. Improved investors' confidence, confidence will boost foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment and other remittances. So therefore, he adds that the CBN should exercise better oversight on forex demands to ensure protection of the market from speculative assault and illicit capital outflows. Well, talking about the CBN, the MPC begins its meeting today. And of course, that's going to dominate the news. Started on Friday. On Friday, we spoke to Professor of Finance and Capital Market, Professor Uche Wale. Waleke, and he spoke on some of the considerations that are before the MPC as they begin the meeting today to make the announcement known tomorrow. Financial conditions are already tight. Um, and um, against that back backdrop, uh, it wouldn't be um, again in the interest of um, the system to say you are um, you know, further tightening. You're also increasing the MPR. And it's not, remember, it's not just the NPR we are looking at here. Um, the NPR is one, uh, of course, it represents the, the, uh, the anchor. Uh, but we also have um, other instruments that they have also been using to further tighten. And one of which is the um, capital uh, you know, reserve requirements. Um, the liquidity ratio is also another. And uh, with particular respect to the CRR, if you compare Nigeria's CRR with uh, the CRR in other um, economies, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, what you know you would find is that the Nigerian CRR is um, a bit on the high side, at 32.5%, uh, um, which is why I welcome the idea of reducing the CRR uh, with respect to merchant banks by um, uh, seven, virtually, uh, I think, around 70%. You know, down to 10%. 10 um, of course, what that means is that um, um, merchant banks will now be in a stronger position to uh, finance, um, um, you know, uh, the projects and uh, to also lend to, you know, the real sectors, um, you know, of, of the economy. And you, you'll agree with me that in taking decisions, you know, regarding um, even trying to reduce inflation, there should also be a consideration of, um, of um, output. In the first quarter of 2023, uh, just as we uh, know from the MBS, uh, GDP growth rates you know, dropped, you know, came down to 2.31%. And I wouldn't be surprised if by the time GDP, uh, the second quarter numbers you know, come in, we also experience a further decline. So there is need for the central bank to support growth. Uh, one way by which they can support growth is to also see how they can ease this, um, um, you know, uh, monetary policy. And yes, we are counting down to the announcement of the decision of MPC tomorrow. Meanwhile, uh, we are supposed to be in meeting in as we speak. So let's start our meeting concerning the MPC. That's a monetary policy committee meeting for July, you know, is once in two months. And, and see what they should be discussing at this time as we have our own discussion now and joining us. Follow up on that conversation by Professor Waleke is Mr. Gospel Obele. Uh, he is a chief economist with uh, Street Nomics and joins us from the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Obele, thank you so much for your time this morning. Good morning. 
Thank you for having me. Good morning. Great to be here today. Good to have you. So um, you had Professor Waleke there. Of course, the issue of CRR, which was reduced for the Merchant Bank, uh, of course, is also dominating conversations around the MPC meeting. And we cannot run away from inflation at 22.7%. Uh, Obviously, that is number one. Uh, and we know that at the last meeting, um, the now embattled uh, governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria had defended uh, the rate hike, saying that if there was no rate hike, that things would have been worse than it is now. Do you expect the MPC to continue its rate hike in this meeting they're having now? Thank you so much um, for having me once again. I think there are lots of cards on the table to play out. Um, the inflation construct right now that we deal with is no longer just monetary, you know, in sense. You know, you have lots of factors contributing to the current inflationary state of an Nigerian economy beyond just monetary economics, money supply and all that. Um, you have the fact that um, in the last one year, um, the pre-elections, the full scarcity, the wrong um, poor management of the Naira, and also the uncertainties around the outcome of the elections and the new government coming in, the roller coaster of policies that's happened in recent times have put the economy at a level of cost of living um, where you have some more pressure in and you have a situation where people are spending more of their incomes just trying to get through on the basic necessities they need to get a life on a daily basis. So meaning that inflation is no longer just a monetary phenomenon, but how we manage our economy has penetrated deeply into the cost fabric of the economy right now. So on one end, we're dealing with infl an inflationary crisis. On the other end, we're dealing with a cost of living crisis, as it were. And in my own opinion, I do not think that interest rates are enough in the context of dealing with an inflationary construct that is non-monetary in itself or not completely monetary in itself. All right. So you're also thinking about the, the downside of the Russian Ukraine for Ukraine war, climate change, and all of those important inflationary impacts on the Nigerian economy. So if you look at it, you know, holistically, you understand that there are different meaning, moving parts that are feeding into the inflationary numbers as such. And as much as interest rates is a necessary condition to deal, it is not sufficient in context to what two mix are required to bring down inflation. All right. So however. Uh, best conventional case is to use interest rate, which is where the world is, you know, is at today. And um, in my own simple opinion, I think at the very best case and hopeful case of things would be for the central bank to retain rates. But uh, moving with the bandwagon will be that the rates may be increased at least maybe by 5%, 7% window. Mm, I guess the bandwagon is no longer moving because we saw South Africa just last week, they did retain rates. You know, yeah. and uh, we are hearing the Fed Reserve also talking about halting its rate hikes. I don't know if it will be for this meeting or for the next one. So uh, I guess at this point, and, you know, there's also the factor that uh, this will be the first time that the MPs will be meeting without uh, the embattled uh, governor, uh, Godwin Emefiele, yeah. in nine years. So uh, maybe that will also add a little bit of trick. And we've, we've uh, I don't know if to call it the president's uh, body language where he has said that, he expects or he would prefer to work with a single-digit interest rate, even though that seems very far away. So when you put all this <laughs> together, perhaps the, the MPC would decide to halt the movement for a bit, you think? <laughs> yeah, that's, so that's why I said the best-case scenario would be they will hold because of all these factors you mentioned. Um, clearly, there were strong um, beyond monetary factors that were influencing the state of the interest. Um, South Africa has its own nuance to deal and, um, you know, choose, in terms of choosing to finally hold on the interest rates. And you also want to look at possibilities of Afri other African countries maybe following suit. And the reason why it's important is because we need that economy space to breathe in context of the roller coaster of policies that's currently happening. We want to also be able to see the impact of the current or the new administration policies and what it hopes to do, you know, in the context of the real economy and the financial markets and all of that going forward. And so it's just best you hold rates so that you can literally allow the economy to pace through these policy changes and these trying times, you know, to layer on on that, thinking of the first subsidy and all that. So, um, and, and again, I mean, it's the first time in a long time we've had a very decisive president, quote and unquote. And uh, we're also trying to look at how that body language, like you mentioned, will impact on the conversa conversations today and the final outcome tomorrow morning.
although within the context of context of things, I would not still be ultimately surprised if there's if there's there to be an increase. If at all there's going to be an increase, it's going to be a very little, maybe not so significant increase, but it's tilting more like a perception to hold than to increase. Because like I mentioned, there are too many cards on the table and increasing will further, you know, sort of push the economy on the edge a bit more and may, count, may be counterintuitive to what the new president hopes to achieve, you know, on the many grounds of the policies he's planning to run with. Mm. There's also another factor that uh, surfaced last week. We had the number that a currency in circulation increased by 9 trillion naira in one month, May to June. That's also another threat to, you know, yeah. hyperinflation. Yeah. I've been asking, I've been trying to understand, I don't, I don't know if you can help me, where the money just flowed in from? Is it from the politicians? Where, where did 9 trillion naira come out from yeah. in, in, in a mean, month? It's, it's, it's very easy um, economic math, you know, let me so to say, because the reason why you have higher money in circulation right now is because people are spending more, all right? People are spending more, not necessarily because they're earning more, but because the cost of having a life is also increasing. So technically, if you need, let's say, for instance, now Nigeria is still a very cash-driven economy. So if you need 750 Naira to buy a, a to buy bread, for instance, right now you're spending close to 1K, 1.5, 1.7, as the case may be, based on where you live as well, in cash to buy. So you have more monies in cash in circulation, not necessarily because politicians are spending more, but generally because the whole economy in context is spending more as a result of rising cost of living, rising cost of doing business. So, and that's a bit of a very, very interesting dynamic to watch because uh, when you think of the fact that the first subsidy is in code gone and um, the perception of a unified exchange rate and all of these economics, then you can boldly say that that would also have a cost push impact on the economy. And a cost push would technically mean people will spend more. But the problem with this nature of increased spending is that it doesn't come with increased income or increased standard of living or quote unquote a better life. So it's sort of taking more from the people than it's enabling. So what you have is that inflation reveals that there is an increasing poverty trap. Poverty trap because the the bar to have a basic to have your basic necessities met on a daily basis is rising. All right, if you do not have a certain amount of income, a certain amount of disposables, you cannot have a quality of life at a certain level. So it's costing more, and it's um, leading to rising expense in terms of exchange of naira in in, in terms of uh, in the real economy for people to have a life and to, to just live life on a daily basis. And when you factor that into the overall scheme of things, it's likely very unhealthy for the economy. And you now find out that the same thing you're trying to use interest rates to fight, you know, is looking as though your, your efforts are, are not yielding much, which is why I started off by saying that the inflation we're dealing with right now and the rising money in supply is not necessarily because of monetary factors, but largely because of strong policy dynamics that have been largely incoherent and they are eating deeply into the, the disposable spend of the average Nigerian, which is also very worrisome, by the way. Mm. So obviously, from what you're saying, uh, MPC meeting, rate hike or no rate hike, will not necessarily solve the problem uh, that yeah, the country... They may not be, yes, there may not be a fundamental change in the grand scheme of things. Because, I mean, for, for vulnerable economies, it takes a longer time for the impact of policy incoherence to sort of fizzle out. But are we on the like, right track? Are we on the right track, Mr. Billy? When we see, uh, when we just take a look at what the president has done, we've seen the FX unification statement or effort. Uh, we've seen, of course, the subsidy removal, which is the biggest one where, and uh, the change in price of petrol affecting transportation, uh, awaiting palliative. And now even we have the issue of the school loan, you know, which is also yeah. a big issue now. It's, I mean, yeah. it might be quiet now, but September is around the corner. Students will be back <laughs> at school, and then we will get that conversation up and running. So would yeah. you say that, yeah, of course, when there are policies, there's a time lag before we expect uh, the implementation to also to have the expected impact. But are we on the right track? So, I mean, it's first of all um, very important to, to establish that the Nigerian economy is currently in a very dear but very complex state. So there is virtually no policy you're going to take right now or execute on right now that doesn't have its downsides or doesn't have a trade-off. And these are part of the effects of having that long-term fiscal indiscipline you've had in the Nigerian economy in past administration leading up until now. All right, so it's sort of you know trying to manage the complexities 
of uh, many downsides over the years. So are we on the right track? I mean, it's, it depends on who is looking at it and where you're looking at it from. So from one angle, we've seen that with the roller coaster of policies recently, it's been so much of a roller coaster that we, you know you would expect some breather in between, you know, sort of, because uh, the current administration inherited an economy that was really, really, really on the verge of collapse to start with. So um, it would be a very bad time to roll out so much policies that will, you know, probably pressure further down on the average Nigerian. But on the flip side of things, some of the policies that have been rolled out recently um, by the new administration have been a bit positioned to restore confidence in the new administration as well as investors' confidence. So policies like uh, taking out the subsidy, policies like um, unifying the exchange and all that. However, those policies are very complex and difficult decisions to make because they have very huge um, uh, um, trade-off uh, consequences for the Nigerian people and the economy. So are we on the right track as a function of how much are we seeking to balance out? I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So how much are we seeking to balance out? So you want to mention palliatives here. Yeah, palliatives are fair, but they would not necessarily fix the problem at the heart of that problem or the heart of the issue. So technically, what I would think of is, first of all, before you make a policy, you want to identify what are the clear-cut social intervention initiatives that can be introduced to provide a soft landing on the other end of the trade-off, which is very key. So what has happened in recent times is that you've been having, you've been having too many policies thrown into the space, and then you're taking a cue back to look at what palliatives can be introduced. So that's technically sort of working a bit reactive on the value chain, and it, it's sort of retrogressive as well, which is why you're asking, are you on the right track? So if you have to answer it from that point of view, it's a bit retrogressive. <music>
a lot of young people, they go to a restaurant, they post, they are, some go to, like the you know, on the street. Group of people? <laughs> I mean, very recently. Yeah, you so see, and Bassi. you saw the kind of support that Lydia, uh, uh, Hilda Linda Bassi, Bassi Hilda. you know, got from there. Hilda, I mean, because Food Bay TV equally, you know, Food Bay supported, you know, that initiative. That is just to show you that a lot of young people love food. Millennials and Gen Z alike, they love food. But when you speak about food or when the government is speaking about food, we're talking agriculture. So we did at uh, Food Bay, we did a deep dive, you know, got on the, uh, the street to speak to a couple of young people, you know, to find out what they know. Do you like food? Yeah. They, oh, yeah, I love food. What's your favorite food? Oh, yeah. They tell you, yeah, I, I like Nkwobi. I like, you know, suya. I like all that. But when you go to agriculture, do you, you know, what, what is agri agriculture to you? What they have in their minds is poverty, um, laborious, you know, profession, something that is not, they don't want to be associated with. Now, how can the government bridge that gap? I think that's the question here. We feel that the first thing is two people cannot work together except they agree. Young people need to trust what the government is doing. And so the mindset and reorientation is the very first place to start. Number two, we need to involve a lot of people. There's so many young people doing, uh, great, doing a great job within the food space. On digital space from Ifi Monye, you know, Ifi's Kitchen, um, Hilda but Bassi. They, but they are dealing with the finished product. We are talking of getting it from the source or creating it, production. Yes, but you have to... So even you on the show, maybe you tone down the use of the word agriculture because the perception of young people when you mention agriculture it's is negative. Farming, farming that's, what they see. that's what they see. So you need to tone down on that and let's start using words like farm to table so that it's a bit more inclusive and they feel, you know, okay, why am I talking about the farm? That, that would make them more interested because they are very uninterested about agriculture. You know, um, that's one. Number two, the government also needs to communicate, you know, the value chain and the opportunities in between. There's so many things that can be done. You know, when you plant on the farm and the harvest is done, a lot happens between when the harvest is done and when it lands on our table. We don't even get to see it in the media. We don't see a lot of that in the way they would love to see it. Young, How would they love to see it? It needs to be packaged well. It needs to be branded. It needs to look, it needs to be colorful. You know, Gen Z, they love things that are colorful. They love things that are exciting, you know, and we need to move away from the functionality of food. Would it help if... Um, I, I, I think the picture you're trying to paint yeah. is obviously remove that poverty factor. Absolutely. You know? And when you remove that poverty factor, then you see the fanciful tractors and equipment, even on the farm, uh, the planters, you know, uh, I think they have the one that waters the water. You have drones. You, know, you have you know, drones yeah, and absolutely. things like that. Would it help if we took this to schools? universities, you know, because there you were already painting the picture from the mindset because a lot of Gen Zs are very impatient. <laughs> they, they don't have a lot of patience. They're not like their parents who would, oh, let me work day one, day two, day 31 and get a salary. And then, you know, a lot of Gen Zs do not have that. They want to see the end the, from the beginning, beginning and absolutely. things like that. So do you think it will help? if we took this message more to schools? Absolutely. I mean, taking it back to school and taking it back to our homes, you know, uh, would go a long way in helping us. So parents I mean, do have a responsibility. Have, it's there. a collective responsibility. I mean, if the government just declared state of emergency on food security, it means that we are involved. Everyone is involved. I mean, growing up for me, uh, my parents had like a little garden, you know, behind our house. So, as a secondary school, you know, boy, I on once I'm back from school, I go back there and I plant something. But that's I was a planting. subsistent farming. Absolutely, I we did need to it go. Too, but it was subsistent farming. It was something you did with the little hole and So when like you that. start from there, because you need to start from somewhere, you know, you need to 
permit this word I want to use, the government needs to make agriculture sexy for Gen Z. I mean, permit me. I, I, I apologize, but it needs to be attractive. It needs to be something that they look at. And where do we need to get it right? We need to, like you mentioned, go back to our schools, go back home, you know, um, use the media. We're using mainstream media, which is fantastic. We need to, the government also needs to come on digital media and get involved, use stakeholders that are influencing to actually take some influencers back to the farm. Let us teach our children because some of them don't even know what we have. We have a lot in Nigeria, you know, that we can showcase, but we're not doing that. And that is one of the ways that we can, you know, bridge this gap. Mm. So um, now that the president has declared a state of emergency, we are waiting the announcement of ministers and hopefully we should get the names before this week runs out. I think the president has until uh, July 29, Nine, yeah. you know, uh, today is 20. Four. Four. Yeah, so five days, five more. days so, to go. So we hope that before the end, so we can put this, pose this responsibility to the Minister of Agriculture to say, yes, the president has declared a state of emergency, but what exactly does it mean? I mean, you can declare a state of emergency and nothing moves, nothing changes, and uh, uh, the Federal Executive Council sits. And then when they're having their meetings, they have, you know, stakeholders from the agriculture. But what really does it put food on the table, table, you know? So we do hope that when we get that announcement this week of the Minister of Agriculture, among others, then we can pose it to the minister to say, now you are on board. The president has made this announcement. What do you think should be the minister's first few steps, your perspective? I mean, orientation. I would start from there because I think there's a lot missing right there. The government already stated that they are making seedlings available. They're making a lot of things available for, you know, Nigerians. But then the question there is, do people trust that process? We don't. A lot of people don't. A lot of young people don't. So that speaks to mistrust of government system. Government system. Mm. So, um, I mean, whoever the, the you know, uh, minister you know, would be by the time the pronouncement is made, you need to earn the trust of the people. Once you do that, we also need to see, because a lot of people do so much without amplification. You also need to be able to come, and amplification is not only in the way that you feel it should be done. You know, you have mainstream media, it's now important to have a lot of amplification done via digital means or channels. Because that's you where know? you have the youth. That's where you have the youth. A lot of them have phones, you know, phones that you and I might not even have. You know, so a lot of young people want to see what the government is doing. And then let's have some sort of inclusion. Let's have a lot of young people be a part of that process. It would also help to find a lot of young people in the cabinet that is to be pronounced. That would help greatly because once I see someone I can relate with, it's easier for me to go with creative ideas to them that this is how you can get it done. Another thing I think I should mention is um, in, in terms of agriculture, they, I mean, because when the pronouncement was made, we, we got that uh, fertilizers and, you know, seedlings, all of that will be, you know, given to farmers. Now, how many of these farmers actually get this, you know, uh, uh, maybe resources? We need to use cooperatives because our local government system has collapsed. So, I mean, in, 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 in a sense. So it's important to use cooperatives so that the people that need those materials or fertilizers or seedlings they get it as at when you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Lua Femi Wundoro, uh, Group Managing Director of Maxima Group. Uh, thank you for your insight this morning. And we do know that government is listening. As the minister comes on board, his job is already cut out for him. We have to deal with this food insecurity it's in Nigeria. very important. And very we do important. hope, I mean, you would also use your TV and your platform and communication with the youth yeah. to try to uh, communicate you understand them, uh, yeah, what absolutely. needs to be done to get the youth involved because that's where the huge population of Nigeria lies absolutely. at the end of the day. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. All right. So um, food security, inflation, and uh, inflation is still high up there. And, uh, well, we see how the NPC will react to it. But food is very, very top.
on the list of that. As we know, it's a huge part of the inflation that Nigeria faces at this time. Now, let's head to the market now with Anita Edit and see uh, a summary of how the market uh, performed last week. Hi, Anita. Good, yeah, good morning. morning and happy mm. new week. Happy new week to you too. Mm. Well, um, for the markets, across the markets, I'm, I'm talking about four markets uh, for, as at last week. You're a it big was, man. You have four markets exactly. at your disposal. But, all right. But we always invest. Some can, some can invest in all markets or just one market. <laughs> it's a choice. Yeah. It's where your interest lies. Obviously. So, but for the four markets, we had positive sentiments, starting first with the Forex market, up until the fixed income market. Well, our reserve dropped last, uh, yeah, yeah, last yeah. week. Yeah. We'll be having our so guests. So two-year low. Yeah, to a two-year low. Yeah. And I guess we'll be talking more about that. All right. So, but for now, let's talk about the turnover for last week. As at July the 21st, this is how it turned out for the market, the Forex market. 6.49%, which was largely driven by the epic spot market. That was the major factor while the market turnover went up to about 6.49% to $419.07 million. And then on the flip side, you also saw that uh, the decline there for the other markets, it was done by the, the FX derivatives and the Naira exchange uh, market. So, but for the Naira, the Naira was down at the Nigeria Autonomous uh, fix, Fixing Rate rates, and it was down by 2.16% to 787.30 Cobra, in contrast to what you had the previous uh, week, which was 779.33 Cobra. But also for the uh, for the uh, investment uh, investors and exporters window, you had an increase on the Naira, which was up by, by more than three Naira. But we will be talking to our guests to give us more details about that. So now, uh, Senator, we have Senator Aldo, fixed income Forex dealer at Access Bank, to tell us more about the market, especially when today is the beginning of the July MPC meeting, the first for this administration and the first without the central bank governor. So it will be held by the acting CBN governor. And of course, we will be looking at whether the CBN will be raising uh, interest rates or will they maintain it or by, by what margin. So now, thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me, Anieti. Okay, Senator. So as, as you as you rightly um, explained, ex as you rightly expressed, the MPC meeting is expected to, um, today with the MPC um, giving a session tomorrow. Uh, there are various considerations for this, this MPC, um, the chief amongst those inflation rates. Uh, we saw the inflation rate print for the, uh, for, for the month of June at 22.79%, um, up from 22.41%. Uh, the key the key rate um, that drove that up was, was the phone inflation, which, which rose to 25.25%, um, up from 24.82%. The MPS, the National Bureau of Statistics, um, emphasized that the figures for June, uh, the, the data action for that was just for the first two weeks of June. And they were expect the, the impact of the, the floating of the exchange rate, as well as the subsidy, subsidy removal, to, uh, to be reflected in subsequent months. So we do expect the MPC to take that into consideration. Um, deliberations. So uh, we regard uh, we, uh, regarding the parameters, we do expect the MPC to adjust um, some or, or multiple parameters. The parameters they do review at the MPR, which is currently at eighteen point five percent. The asymmetric corridor, which is currently at plus hundred bips minus seven hundred bips around the MPR, the ratio at thirty percent, and the CRR at thirty two point five percent. We did see review in the, for the um, CR which I'm back down to 10% from 32.5%. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the MPC does tomorrow. Okay, so that's, that's for the MPC. So, but this time, let me, let, let's take a look at uh, Nigeria's Forex reserves, our, our external reserves. It has fallen to a two-year low we earlier mentioned to around uh, 33.98 billion naira, uh, dollars. And then, of course, we, we see it continually dry, going down. So what is responsible for this decline in the country's reserves, which is, of course, a source of concern for, 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 for the country? Um, okay, as Riley said, the reserves are currently at about 33.98 billion. Um, the, the, the CBN um, recently um, instituted the policy of um, a willing seller, willing buyer, FX market. And this has, of course, led to 
um, constitution that the demand in the market is significantly more than the supply. We've seen a depreciation in rates. Um, you, you did mention at the, at the top of the, um, of the show that the, the NFX rate is currently about 770, 780 level. Um, so the CBN, of course, is, is, um, is intervening in the market, and that would, of course, reflect in the reserves. The reserves are, however, at the at the um, robust position at over 30 billion, and um, we do not expect that it is a cause for concern yet. Uh, so we do we don't we don't expect jitters along that front um, in the secondary market, and we haven't seen that much. With regards to the fluctuations in in the exchange, um, we 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 interpret as market players adjusting to the new norm and exercising caution around their dealings. So we do expect some sort of stabilization in the near term. I'm around this um, current policy. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you for that analysis, uh, Senator. So we'll leave it there. We're running out of time. But we do appreciate uh, your analysis on the market for today. So that was uh, Senator Aldu, Forex dealer at Access Bank, giving us details about the market, uh, especially as we look at the MPC meeting starting today. Yeah. So Maya, thank you so much. Of course, I'll be in the news so much. I'm in the MPC meeting. Thanks, Anita, for that update. Uh, running out of time, but we'll have to run straight to London where Juliana is standing by. Juliana, good morning. Happy New Week. I hope you had a restful weekend. But um, I, I saw this story that kind of disturbs me, talking about accounts being shut down uh, due to people's political views. Please help us understand that. Yeah, good morning, um, Any Woke Wars has reached uh, the British financial institutions. Um, this is a story that has kind of dominated news here in the UK over the past couple of weeks concerning Nigel Farage, who was the former leader of the UK Independence Party or UKIP or the Brexit Party. Um, he's not popular with everybody. Some consider his views to be xenophobic or racist, um, but he has never been engaged with any illegal activity, which is why he was surprised uh, when a couple of weeks ago he received a 40-page letter uh, from a private bank called Coots. Coots is owned uh, by the NatWest Group, uh, but it is a bank uh, for the world's wealthiest. Um, I believe King Charles has an account there, as well as uh, several other high net worth individuals around the world. This was then linked to leaked to the media. And so what we first heard of this story is that Nigel Farage's account was closed because he didn't meet um, the wealth threshold, which I believe is depositing or having at least a million pounds in your account. That was what the BBC reported until uh, the former UKIP leader uh, released um, extracts from the letter he received from Coots, where it was clearly saying that they were closing um, his bank account because his views did not align with the values of the bank. And this is what's led to a media storm. Yes, a lot of people do not agree with Nigel Farage's views, but most people in this country are pretty outraged at the fact that a bank, a private bank, would be able to shut your account purely because um, you say things that are controversial. Uh, now, this has led um, to the city minister, Andrew Griffin, uh, writing an open letter this morning to about 19 banks banks, buildings, societies and financial institutions um, calling on them uh, to basically explain how something like this could happen, even though they're not coot, um, and trying to protect customers uh, from something like this happening again. And now Nigel Farage has received a public apology from Alison Rose, who is the CEO of the NatWest Group, but he wants uh, this probe to go much further. Apparently, Alison Rose was sitting at a dinner with a BBC journalist who leaked uh, the story um, initially. And also as well, it does bring up lots of questions to the British government about politically exposed people, because we know that if you are a PEP, there can be some constraints um, about what kind of accounts you do or do not own. Uh, but certainly, even if you are a PEP, you should have some sort of legal protection, which is why uh, this has become um, a government issue rather than an issue that's just being debated on Twitter. I do trust the system there to take care of it. I mean, that's why we have the government. Uh, but Juliana, we're almost out of time, so um, we'll have to continue this conversation uh, with Laddie at 1.30 p.m. Okay, thank you.
And uh, talking of Laddie, he comes in now with uh, and red. Talking of Laddie. Yeah. Laddie, you're walking talking in a red style. You, yeah. you're almost running to me now. I, yeah. know, I know Bitcoin has dropped, but it's not my fault. I, you're I, wearing red, isn't it? Oh, that's why. You shouldn't have worn red today. Oh, I'm sorry. But let's see why. <laughs> we see the market there. I'll wear green tomorrow. Green. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll take green. I will see um, just the green spots here, looking at Coin360. Showing the heat map from the crypto market now. We're seeing the meme coins there in the green. Let's look at the sentiment quickly now. Uh, we see it's uh, mostly neutral, but greed uh, is, uh, yeah, greed today was neutral um, last week and over the weekend, but we're seeing greed right now. Top two cryptocurrencies we try, we see Bitcoin struggling there, uh, trying to stay above $30,000. Um, dollars. Let's bring in uh, Alumide Adeshina on our financial market analyst. Um, Alumide, good morning. Great to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ladi. Red yeah. Monday. Yeah, yeah, Red Monday. Starting off red, thanks to in his uh, dress there. But what's driving sentiment really in the market? Uh, well, a lot of things right now. But I think um, the elephant in the room is the U.S. Fed. Uh, the U.S. dollar, right as we speak, is rallying against major currencies, asset classes, including the crypto market. And at some point, you know, we saw Bitcoin trying to break above the $30,000 mark on reports that the U.S. Uh, Security Exchange Commission was taking a review of uh, BlackRock and uh, Spot ETF. But the U.S. dollar really uh, caused certain moderation. But taking away from that, you also look at the fact that um, Mimi coins, just like Reddy said, are on the green. And that's not far-fetched from um, Elon Musk's uh, tweet on the launching or revamping of Twitter as X, uh, X.com. So we saw tokens, Mimi tokens that had X um, underlying fundamentals really rallying very high. In fact, some tokens rallied as high as 1,000%. But having said all those things, you, you could also see the fact that despite the fact that Bitcoin has been ranging between the $29,600 support level to the 30000 you could see that uh, big buyers are accumulating. And as we speak right now, um, data suggests by Green Glass Code that over 14 million uh, Bitcoin are kept in stash. Right. So accumulation is still happening regardless. But we're seeing volume dropping with decentralized exchanges. What's driving that? Yeah, the fact is that the market share really dropped from the other amount of 7% uh, to 5%. Liquidity, liquidity providers are not seeing um, their service profitable. And also the fact that institutional investors are breaking away, particularly with the launch of EDX markets. You know, you could recall that some months ago, um, big um, institutional firms in the United States, you know, launched a, a kind of institutional crypto service provider. So that also has taken the shine away. And pretty much, you know, we've had reports about hacks around these decentralized exchanges and regulatory issues. So that has somehow dampened um, the excitement around those. Um, All right. Study. All right. So much to look out for uh, this week and definitely is going to drive sentiment in the crypto market. Thank you so much, Alumide Additional. Thank you for having me. Right. So, um, Ine, that's how the market is looking. And I'm expecting you to wear the same dress, but green color <laughs> tomorrow. Maybe same that might dress. change sentiment. Okay. All right. Green, though. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Yeah. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll tell my wardrobe uh, exactly. attendant to work on that. But Fantastic. we'll see you at 1.30. We'll see, see if anything comes <laughs> up there. Well, thank you so much for being a part of Business Morning this very cold Monday. But I hope we kept you warm a bit. We'll promise to do better tomorrow. Well, I'll be here at 1.30. And don't forget, you can always watch Business Morning at any time on our YouTube channel, our channels web forward slash YouTube. And you can watch again. I'm Ini John. I'll see you tomorrow. God's grace.